Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation about um, financial aid. Uh, this is a really great time to speak about this because we are rolling right into financial aid season. Um, cannot believe that October is coming next week. Um, and that is when kind of financial aid season kicks off for um, this year's seniors in high school. So it is great to be with you all today. My name is Sarah Scruggs. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist at the Credit Union. I also have on the line with me um, Migdalia Gomez, who's the Community Engagement Manager. Um, she will be monitoring questions um, and asking those throughout, so uh, we will get to your questions. To go over the format for today's webinar, um, you all have gone ahead and been muted. Um, we hope that this is a way that you can make sure that you're listening to the correct person, number one. But number two, we hope that this doesn't deter any questions that you may have. Um, we do want to make sure this is interactive and that your questions get answered. So either on the right-hand side of your screen or up at the top, um, there is a questions panel or a chat panel where you can type in your questions and let us know um, if we can answer those for you. Uh, I do ask now if you could just let me know where you're joining us from today so that number one, I know that you can hear me and number two, um, I know that you know where the questions panel is. So if you could go ahead and fill that out, that'd be wonderful. And as we're waiting on uh, folks to do that for us, uh, the one thing that we do want to make sure you know about at the very beginning of this presentation is that you will have access to it. We will send you an email following up um, on today's webinar with some more information um, for you to take a look at and um, has some links to other resources as well. And um, I see that a lot of us are answering home in Medford, BWH, Wakefield. So it's great to see all of you can hear me. Uh, that's always something we like to check. But please know that this presentation will be made available um, and resources as well for you to look over after the presentation has finished. I want to introduce um, Johanna from MGB EAP to talk a little bit more about the EAP um, and the series. So Johanna, you're more than welcome to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Joanna Okoli. I am one of the licensed mental health counselors that is part of the EAP staff. Um, and I'm glad that uh, this workshop is uh, happening today because it is something that is high on the minds of our, all of our employees and definitely a great time to get more information and get more support. Um, in terms of um, EAP, um, the Mass General Brigham EAP is open to all employees of any of the Mass General Partners affiliated uh, organizations, entities. So we offer support to any employee across all of our entities. We do also offer support for any household members of the employees, um, people living within the home. Um, we do offer support for them as well through your benefits. Um, and it's you know, what is EAP? It is not the Environmental Service Agency. <laughs> um, it is uh, the Employee Assistance Program. Um, and so what we do is we offer um, confidential consultation um, and individual short-term counseling uh, support to referrals of any services that the employee might be needing, um, such as, you know, if you need to be connected with a therapist, if you need some information about policies, if you need some guidance on who you need to contact within the entity to get more uh, clear information about policies or your benefits, we do offer support um, to all employees across all entities. We have liaisons in every um, entity, um, and we also um, are, are able to offer support across all entities, not just with the liaison in that entity. Um, we're all uh, skilled and briefed on the policies across our entities. So we offer appointments. Um, you can call 1-866-724-4327. Again, 1-866-724-4327 and ask for a confidential consultation. We offer appointments Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, we also do have um, Tuesday and Thursday until 6. Um, and, you know, you make an appointment where right now we're doing phone sessions, we're doing virtual visits. 
um, so that we can provide employees the support needed. If you have any other um, questions, you can call the EAP mainline that I just gave and ask, and we will make sure to guide you through where we need whatever services you need. Also, you can go through our website, eap.partners.org, and ask for an appointment in, in, uh, through our website as well. So you don't have to just call, you can ask in that manner. Yeah, any questions, please feel free to send in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat in case there's any questions directly to EAP. Uh, thank you so much, Migdalia and Sarah for helping and having EAP part, part of this presentation. Thank you so much. A great rundown of the resources available. Um, and to kick off our presentation, talking a little bit more about the credit union, um, Harvard University Employees Credit Union is a benefit to um, every employee, uh, student, alumni of Harvard University and also all of the affiliated teaching hospitals. So that is how um, MGB EAP is kind of rolled into this. Um, and the credit union is a not-for-profit financial institution of Harvard University, and so we exclusively serve the Harvard community. This means that hopefully our products and our services are focused on this community, um, and we're able to provide you with things um, that are helpful as you go about your daily banking and also um, other things that can possibly help you in your daily lives, like these webinars. Um, we offer these as a service to our community, and we're glad to be here here for this. So if you do have questions about the credit union, we are happy to answer those. Um, if you are not a member of the credit union but are interested in becoming a member, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are happy to help you with all of those questions as well. GreenPath Financial Wellness is a service that the credit union provides to our community for free. This is free one-on-one -on -one budget and credit report counseling. Um, these are done by uh, certified credit counselors. Uh, they do have to get an accreditation. Uh, this is a nonprofit, so they always have your best interest in mind. This is, again, that one-on-one -on -one counseling that we really find to be important. And before we even jump into our topic of financial aid today, I think really what we encourage is that you give Green Path a call or reach out to them to see if they can help you with a budget. Uh, this is definitely an important thing as you think through um, either you going to school in these next few years or your children going to school or grandchildren. Um, this is a really important piece of the puzzle, uh, making sure that you can pay for that. So a great time to call Green Path um, and they'll be happy to help you. All you need to say is that HUECU um, sent you. You do not have to be a member of the credit union to use Green Path. Of course, um, we want to make that available to our full community and you and anyone in your household can use Green Path. Diving into our topic today, starting with what is financial aid, I want to give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I previously worked in higher education in an admissions office um, and saw the entire financial aid process through that lens. And then um, Migdalia also was a director of financial aid at a university prior to joining the credit union. Um, so both of us have a little bit of a different eye towards financial aid, um, and we are lucky to have had those experiences and to be able to speak from that experience. Um, and you all will have a different experience with financial aid as well if you've done this with another student or if you've done this yourself as a student. Um, and so we do want to talk through the basics first and then go a little more in detail about federal funding. So what is financial aid? There are three types of financial aid, uh, the first being federal work study. Federal work study comes directly from the federal government, um, and this would be in the form of a student getting a job, um, and then the job would then pay them money based on the hours that they worked up to a certain amount uh, that federal work study they would qualify for. This does not automatically go on your bill or your account, so this would not be money that you would see through that area. You would see it come through in the form of a check. Then there are loans. Uh, these could be federal student loans or private student loans. We'll speak the most about federal student loans today, um, but know that there are private student loans available. 
and then grants and scholarships. Uh, these are the ones that people get most excited about because grants and scholarships normally mean that that is money you don't have to pay back or work for um, in the same sense as federal work study. Of course, you do have to work for it and applying for it and um, looking for those scholarships or working hard in high school or working hard on your GPA. Um, so know that these are the three types of financial aid um, and there are two different types within that. There's need-based. Need-based is based solely on the family's financial need um, and this would be those grants um, from possibly the federal government or from the school in particular. Um, there's loans that is based on need. Um, everyone is offered the same amount of loan. Some are split up differently based on the family's need. And then work study as well as based on need. So not every student will qualify for work study. So all federal, most of the state and institutional aid is based on need. Um, and this is uh, based on one specific form normally, and we'll talk more about that form as we go on. Then there's also merit-based, um, and this is specifically in recognition of a student's achievements. Um, and this is often compared against others who apply, uh, whether it be that year or prior years. Um, so this, um, this type of aid is not normally based on any type of form or anything of that nature. Um, this one is definitely more based on each student in particular. Um, and one thing to note is that this may or may not be renewable for all four years um, if your student is going to school for four years. So that's something to um, ask questions about, number one, and also be informed of. So when we think about applying for financial aid, um, I'm sure most of you have heard of the FAFSA. Um, the FAFSA, or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, um, is the federal government's form for students to fill out if they would like to qualify for federal student loans. Um, and a lot of schools require it if you would like to be considered for any need-based aid. I know at the university that I worked at, it was a requirement if you wanted to be considered for um, need-based aid. And we also had a um, statewide program for students. And so if they wanted to be considered for that as well, they needed to fill out the FAFSA. So be informed. Um, the FAFSA is not a requirement of every family in the United States. But if you want to be considered for those federal student loans and any federal need-based aid um, that may not be in the form of loans, you want to make sure that um, you fill this out. The FAFSA opens on October 1st each year. Um, I actually was just checking out the website and they already have a little announcement up that says uh, our website will be down on September 30th from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m in preparation for the big day um, of October 1st, and that's coming up next week. So if you have a senior in high school, this is a good time to start getting your documents prepared. So the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or you'll hear it referred to as FAFSA by most admissions offices and financial aid offices. Um, one of the things to point out is that it must be completed each year. So maybe you have a student um, who has finished their freshman year, they need to go ahead and fill it out um, for the next year um, because there could be changes that come from year to year in your tax documents and the federal government wants to make sure that their decisions reflect um, those things. You need an FSA ID. If you've never filled out the FAFSA before for a student, or if that particular student hasn't ever filled that out, um, they will be prompted to make an FSA ID number. Keep this ID number in a safe place um, so that when you do complete it next year, you'll have the FSA ID on hand. And if you'd like to create that FSA um, ID, you can go ahead and do that. Um, now uh, so that that way you know um, that you have that prepared for October 1st. So what information goes into the FAFSA? Maybe some of you have never filled out the FAFSA before, never heard of the FAFSA. 
um, what is the information that goes into there? And I think a lot of a big myth about it is that it's a really tiring, lengthy process. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I think as much as we can be prepared for the information they'll ask us for, the better. So parent and student demographic goes into this. What's the definition of a parent? Um, married parents, including same-sex parents. Um, all parents who live together, whether they are married or not. And then um, if you are divorced or separated from a spouse, um, the custodial parent and their current spouse um, go into the definition of a parent. So that is something to note as you're thinking about um, whose information you might need. The FAFSA will ask for citizenship status, the number of people in your household total. That doesn't mean the number of people in your immediate family. It means that if you have aunts and uncles or cousins living with you, then those people would go into that. Um, and then the number of children in college at the time. Um, and so if there are multiple children in the household or multiple people in the household that are in college, this is something to note. They will take that into consideration when thinking about aid. If a male um, over the age of 18 is applying for uh, FAFSA, they do have to be registered in the Selective Service. This is a flag that will come up to the university um, saying that, you know, this person's FAFSA did not go through because they are not registered with the Selective Service. So if you have a son or if you yourself are applying, uh, please know that they need to do that Selective Service registration. The FAFSA has made it easier for students to do this, um, where you can just go directly from the FAFSA page to the Selective Service page, and they can register themselves right then and there, and that will clear it up. And then you also need to know about the colleges that you're planning on applying to. You do not have to know all of them this first time you do the FAFSA, um, but if your student already has a list going or you yourself know where you're applying, um, go ahead and add those colleges. Colleges can be added after this first round or after you complete the FAFSA. That's why that FSA ID is so important. Hi, Sarah. We've had a couple of questions come in. Um, so yes. wondering now may be a good time to take some of these. Uh, one of the questions that came in was a uh, attendee who was going to be a student and in the past they had used their parents tax documents but now that they will be using their own since they will be independent will their financial aid be different yes it will be so if you um, have in the past used your parents tax documents um, they would have done all of the assessment on your aid based on their income uh, um, and now that you're independent as a 25 year old, um, you will input your information, your tax documents. Um, and so it could look very different <laughs> than what you had um, as a dependent. And now as an independent, uh, this aid could look very different coming from the federal government. Of course, this is different based on if you are um, undergraduate versus graduate, um, but the FAFSA applies to both undergraduate and graduate. So um, yes, it will look very different probably from your parents' tax documents. Thank you. And then the other question um, I was able to answer offsite, it was regarding a registration for another attendee. So I'll turn it back go over to you. Thank you, Magdalia. Uh, great question so far. So please, um, keep using the questions panel if there's something that you want to be made clearer or have a question about um, and we'd be happy to answer those. So what financial information goes into the FAFSA? I think this the question that I answered goes really well into this. Um, the income. If you are filling this out um, for a dependent student, it would be parents' income. If the student is independent, it will be theirs. Um, and so that is taxed and untaxed. Um, and with the FAFSA, they use prior prior years taxes. So um, for this, you would need the 2018 income for the FAFSA. 
Um, so prior prior is um, the tax document that you would use. You wouldn't use the one we just turned in in April, if that makes sense. It would also include your assets. Um, so this is all of your savings, any checking, investments, and a pro property that does not include your primary home. So um, if you have your home um, here in Somerville and then you have another home on Cape Cod, an asset would include the second home, not your primary residence. Um, it does not include retirement accounts, life insurance, or value of a small family business. At the university uh, that I previously worked at, um, quite a bit of our families were rural farming families. Um, and so a lot of their small business farms did not get included in the asset column of um, the financial information. And the distinction between these two is pretty important um, as we talk about the impact of income versus assets. If you find yourself having questions about the FAFSA, and you probably will, um, I definitely recommend reaching out. Um, there is a FAFSA helpline that is extremely helpful. Normally, they can go right in and figure out the issue for you. So if you come up on a computer issue or something that's just not working out for you, go ahead and call the FAFSA hotline. I recommend that you do the FAFSA as early as possible. Um, October 1st, they may have some technical issues. So I normally tell my families October 2nd is a great day to do it, uh, to take some time and do that. But calling the FAFSA hotline will get you help with that immediate issue quickly. Um, and there is a great question that came up. Um, if they're 17 as of October 1st, how do you handle uh, selective service registration? So once they do turn 18, they need to make sure that they go ahead and fill that out. But as a 17-year-old, they'll mark on there that they are not 18 at the time of um, filling out. And then once they turn 18, they will need to fill out the selective service registration. So a great question. So I just spoke about um, assets and income. So what is the impact that assets versus income have on the FAFSA? Um, so your assets are things like second properties, um, investments that you may have outside of your retirement account. Um, so you see that we have three different families here. One has zero dollars in assets, one has seventy-five thousand dollars in assets, and one has one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in assets. And you'll see that um, their expected family contributions, which we'll speak about in a little while, um, don't differ a huge amount. They all have the same income, that's something to note, um, but their expected family contributions don't range um, wildly between 4,000 and um, about 9,000. So you'll see that the difference um, is about $5,000 in between them. So your assets do have an impact, of course, on your estimated family contribution, but the federal government is taking into account that these assets normally um, aren't cash flow <laughs> for people as much as an income. And so you see the income impact is really where you see the largest difference in expected family contribution. Um, and all of these families have the same assets, but they have different incomes ranging from 60,000 to 150,000. And their expected family contributions range in difference of about $24,000. So someone with a larger income um, will have a different expected family contribution um, than someone with a smaller income, because this is more of the cash flow side of things. Uh, this family is receiving more from month to month rather than holding assets that are larger or um, have more monetary value. So that is something to um, note when you're thinking about income versus assets um, and what those things mean. And in Massachusetts, there is um, a FAFSA day. Um, there are events that are held um, in November and January. And so I encourage you um, to go on to fafsaday.org if you are hoping to um, find volunteers that can help you give free assistance. Um, it is a nonprofit 
um, that works with students who may need additional help. So if you know of students who do need additional help with their FAFSA, there are tons of services out there to help them with this, um, including through their um, high school, they can always go to their school counselor and ask if there are any services or resources that they can use. Um, so if you are confused or have questions about the FAFSA, really we don't want you to feel like you're alone. Um, that is really, really important in this process. And in addition to the FAFSA, you may need more financial aid forms. Um, at the university that I worked at, we had the FAFSA, and that was what families filled out. Um, we did not have additional, but I do want to make, make you aware of those additional documents that may be um, necessary, depending on the school your child is, um, you or your child is applying to. There's something called the CSS, Financial Aid Profile, um, and this is used by different universities and schools. Um, this is through the College Board, and um, it will just ask for additional information, um, and they will always use the FAFSA, yes, but this would be an addition to. Um, and so at this time, I don't know of any schools just using the CSS. Um, most schools use um, not only the FAFSA, but also an additional form. And there could be a college or university form that your student needs to fill out to be um, eligible for some of the opportunities from specific universities and colleges. Um, I know for us, it was important for students to fill out um, additional information if they were invited to a merit aid competition or something of that nature. So be on the lookout, know that universities and colleges all do it differently. Unfortunately, um, we don't have that totally one size fits all everything. Um, so do know that this could um, change and it could be different for each university, especially going into a time of a lot of financial uncertainty. Um, so be informed that the FAFSA may not be the only thing you fill out. One of the most important things uh, that I stress to my students and to my families was that you need to submit these forms by the deadlines. Um, each college and university will have different deadlines, so um, you are not going to see a total across the board. It's due by this date. I have to have it in. Each university and college will have a different date. It was really important um, for our students to be able to be offered certain scholarships, certain opportunities that they have everything in on time. And so I definitely recommend making sure you're organized with all of this, um, whether that be for grad school, for undergraduate. Um, I really recommend that you keep yourself organized and understand when things are due for which university and college. And there's a great question that came in. Um, the FAFSA is available to all students, graduate and undergraduate. Um, the CSS, I've never seen used um, by a graduate school, but that doesn't mean there aren't graduate schools out there using it. Um, and then for um, a lot of graduate schools will use their own form. I know my husband is in graduate school and he has his own form through the university that he fills out each year um, in addition to the FAFSA. So that's a great question. What things are available for graduate students versus undergraduate? Thank you for helping me make that clear. So how are these financial decisions made? When um, a university or a college looks at a FAFSA um, and looks at the information that's come in, what, does, what are they looking for? How do they make those decisions? They use um, a couple of different numbers. The first being cost of attendance. So the cost of attendance, or COA, is how you'll hear it used a lot of times. They're going to take into consideration the direct costs. So these are the things you would typically think about when you're thinking of paying for college. Tuition, room and board, and any fees. They're taking all of that into account, as well as indirect costs. Transportation to and from campus, personal expenses. They have a budget every year that they set at 
uh, the university level of personal expenses based on surveys that they give to students um, each year. So this is a really good look at how much students are spending outside of those tuition room board um, fees. And they also add into account books and they come up with the cost of attendance. The cost of attendance is what you will see um, normally advertised by the university. This is what some people call the sticker price of the institution. Um, and the sticker, the um, cost of attendance varies widely from college to college. Um, I'm sure you've seen that already and have heard about that. Uh, that is the case. I um, worked at a private institution and at private institutions, our cost of attendance is much higher than at state universities. Um, so I definitely recommend looking into the cost of attendance. Yes, knowing the cost of attendance, that's important. Um, and the cost of attendance has to be up on the university's website. It is a requirement that they have this. So don't hesitate to go and look around on the website and learn a little bit more about how much that university does cost per year. But also knowing that um, at a lot of private institutions and some state schools, um, students are not paying that, not all students are paying that full amount. Um, or that full cost of attendance. So just know um, that that number normally is rather large. Not every student going to that school is paying that number. And then there's the EFC or the expected family contribution. Uh, this is something I spoke about earlier. The expected family contribution is a number that you'll receive after you complete the FAFSA. Uh, this is what will come up after you complete it. And this number is used to help determine financial aid eligibility. Um, and we tell families this is not what you are going to be. Um, this, this will not be your bill for school. Uh, this will not be the exact number you'll be paying for a student or for yourself as you go into graduate school. But it is what is used to help determine the eligibility of um, your student or yourself. So that's something to take into consideration is that don't expect that that's what you'll pay for college. Um, a lot of times families um, may think that that's what they're on the hook for and that's just not the case. It's used to help determine the financial aid eligibility. At the end of the day, uh, the family is primarily responsible for contributing to the student's education. Um, so if you're going into graduate school, that would be yourself. Um, you are primarily responsible for that. Um, but why we use the EFC and the expected family contribution is because hopefully it standardizes the awarding process across the United States um, and that students are able to um, know, okay, I'll be eligible for this much in student loans from the federal government um, at any university. So hopefully it's standardizing that process um, and that financial aid offices are able to use that to determine um, the eligibility of students. Know that debt is not considered in this. Um, there are some special considerations that are taken. Um, in my time working in higher education, um, there is always opportunity to ask those questions if you could be considered for additional aid, um, but I did not see a ton of um, money go through the appeal process or picking up a lot of additional aid through that. But if your um, financial situation has changed significantly from your 2018 tax return to now, financial aid offices want to work with you. Um, they want to make sure that um, students are eligible for the aid that they would be eligible for. Okay, that's a really important thing to think about. We know that um, a lot of students' financial situations have changed um, just in the past eight months, um, since the beginning of the year. And so they wanna make sure that if there are special considerations and special circumstances that they need to be made aware of, please let them know. Um, and the best way to do this is contacting the financial aid office of the university or college directly or the admissions counselor in that process so that they can be made aware and that there may be special provisions taken for you. 
So the financial aid formula, pretty basic view is that they take the cost of attendance of a university and they subtract your expected family contribution. And then that will show the financial need of a family or the financial aid eligibility. Does that mean that's how much financial aid you'll be getting? No, <laughs> um, unfortunately that is not always the case. Um, not every university, most universities are not able to meet full need for every student. So another way to picture it, if you're a visual person like myself, um, you'll see that the left-hand side um, is the cost of attendance of a university, and then the blue is the EFC. And so the yellow bar is the need. For each college, it's very different. Going from college A all the way to college D, you'll see that for college A, the need um, is quite a bit more than for college D where there isn't much need. And this is um, a very basic look at this, obviously, but is essentially what financial aid offices are doing. I want to stress, like I said, that cost of attendance or sticker price can be extremely scary, I think, for a lot of people. Um, but don't rule out applying to a school because of the cost. Um, I really encourage students, at the end of the day, you need to be comfortable with the decision that you're making. And um, a lot of times, if you don't even know what those numbers could be because you never tried, uh, then you may not feel as comfortable after knowing the whole picture and then making your decision. So I really recommend going ahead and um, not ruling out any school just because of the cost of uh, the cost of attendance or the sticker price that you may see. And that goes for graduate school as well as um, undergraduate. Collegecosts.ed.gov um, does have a couple of resources available. Um, the net price calculator is required to be on every university and college's website. This is where uh, they would estimate the possibility of what you could possibly be eligible for in scholarships and grants and um, loans. Is the net price calculator 100% correct all of the time? No but it can give you a good estimate of what your family may be eligible for at a specific university. Um, and like I said, it is required to be on every university's website. So if your student is especially interested in a certain school, they do have to have the net price calculator. Um, I don't believe that graduate schools are required to have the net price calculator, but for undergraduates, that is required. When you get the award letters, this is pretty far on down the road. Um, financial aid season, of course, is beginning, but um, it is definitely not time for people to begin getting award letters. Um, if you're planning on starting a program in the fall, your award letter would probably come later in the spring. We started sending them out in March normally uh, for our students. And March is normally around the time that people begin sending them out, um, but universities are all very different. Um, for graduate school, you may see these award letters come back at different times because of different start dates for different programs. So how do you compare award letters? Let's say you have different award letters from different universities and you wanna see what would be the best bang for my buck, um, essentially. So you see over here, the cost of attendance at this university is $50,000. Um, and the estimated family contribution is $10,000. So the need there would be $40,000. We have three universities who can offer different um, aid based on this student, based on their financial eligibility, based on those things. A couple of things that I wanna point out. College A has given the student more grants and scholarships than College C or College B. Why is this? It could be a number of reasons. Um, this university could have more money to pull from. Um, this university could um, have, a, have students that um, their average GPA is lower than this student who's applied, so they've given them more grant or scholarship for that. Um, for being above average, um, or um, it could be that 
um, you know, they do have that more money to pull from. One thing that is similar across all of these institutions is the student loan amount that the student is eligible for. I point this out because that is federal student loans that they are including. No university um, will show you the private amount of loan that a student is eligible for inside of this student loan number. Um, they would put it on the information, but they wouldn't wrap it up into that student loan number from the federal sources. Every freshman um, is eligible for $5,500 in federal student loans. Uh, they can be split up in different ways between two different loans or just have one uh, type of loan. For graduate students, um, that number is very different, obviously, um, because students are normally paying for graduate school on their own. Um, and so that number could be a little bit higher from the federal government that is available to you. But that is based on your eligibility, based on your EFC. Work study. This looks different at different universities uh, because each university gets an amount of money um, that can be awarded to students for federal work study. So this could be different um, as financial aid offices are um, kind of balancing their sheets. So you'll see that the total aid awarded um, from College A is uh, quite a bit higher than all the way to College C. So um, you'll see that there's still unmet need for every single one of these universities. Um, know that that is more than likely going to happen. <laughs> um, a lot of students are uh, perplexed by this, but that is because there are very few universities who can say we will meet 100% of the need of all of our students. Um, and so that is something to expect of um, the financial aid process. And so we really want to talk about the true cost of these universities. Um, we hope that um, you know your student will be there for more than just one year. Uh, a lot of universities will just give you the number in their financial aid packets that says the one year cost. They may even break it down further into, oh, this is just the amount you'll pay per month if you're on a payment plan or something of that nature. So be sure that you read through that information extremely well because it can be quite confusing, but you really wanna make sure you're comparing apples to apples when you're doing all of this. So the build cost of each of these universities um, is quite different. It ranges from $50,000 to $20,000. Um, and you'll see that um, this kind of just brings over the information from the um, last slide of what the student is eligible for at that institution. You'll see that it takes out the total amount of aid that's awarded. And the tuition bill is what you'll see last. So this is what you would be billed by the institution. This is without any additional um, private loans or outside scholarships that your student may be awarded. Um, so just be sure to note that. Um, but you'll see that there's quite a difference in between the cost of College A and the cost of College C. And not all students wish to take loans. Um, and students are not required to take loans. Um, and so we show you here the true cost, um, and this is without any of the loans um, included. So you'll see 5,500 put back on each of those um, because a lot of students choose not to take um, those student loans, whether that be for graduate school or undergraduate. And the big picture here is that we hope our students are in school and completing school for a certain number of years. As a graduate student, you may be able to finish school in one year or two years, um, so you do need to calculate that. But if you're helping an undergraduate student or you're going back to undergraduate school yourself, um, estimate those costs for the actual amount of time that you'll be there. This number will be very large, more than likely. <laughs> um, it won't be uh, a really like exciting number for you more than likely. Uh, but what you need to think about is the investment that you're making in um, your own education 
um, as well as your student's education. So um, this number may help you see, okay, this is the long, the long version I need to plan for. And I really recommend that you do sit down and write that out. Um, but this doesn't mean that the cost won't change between the first year and the last year. There could be a difference in price at the university, yes, or your student could earn additional grants and scholarships, or they could be eligible for more work study based on um, the changes to the FAFSA. So know that that estimated cost for four years is really more of that estimate um, you're seeing. So it is good to sit down and do this, excuse me, <clears throat> and to really see, okay, this is the true cost of the four years of this institution or two years or three years of this institution. One website that will point you to that I think is helpful for undergraduate students as well as graduate students is studentaid.gov. This is a great website, website for resources about paying back your student loans, um, about what's available. Also has some information on different universities and the programs that they offer. Um, and I really recommend um, making sure that you check out studentaid.gov before um, you really dive into um, college and university uh, applying for student aid because it can be really confusing um, and it can take some time to learn and to understand. Um, but hopefully this presentation gave you kind of a look a peek inside of what um, student aid, how those decisions are being made at different universities and colleges for different types of students.